please welcome the remarkable first time uh, writer director Fran Kranz. Thank you, Fran. Thank you. Hi. Um, Fran, welcome. Um, when, I, when, I, when I introduced the film to this crowd, I told them that um, I, I, first I didn't want to be in a room with four people. Um, this will be so uncinematic, but I told them this is an incredible cinematic journey. Um, you, Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, you put, so, it, it's so subtle. It, it looks very realistic, your approach, and very naturalistic, your approach to the subject matter, but you have made some very um, mm. uh, thought through um, choices. Um, I want to start with the idea of the aspect ratio change. Yeah. Um, and, and why was that made, and, the time, and in particular, the moment that you switch the visual aspect ratio of the movie. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. I, um, uh, I, sort of, I feel like I have to live and die by that decision. Um, if it doesn't work for someone, there's nothing I can do about it. I, uh, we, we, uh, the, in essence, the idea was this event changed their lives forever changes the way they see the world. Um, and then that's really what tragedy and grief and loss does. You, you, you lose someone very close to you. The world is not the same. You're, you sort of have to move through it differently for quite some time and grief kind of changes you. So I wanted, to, I wanted to illustrate that or reflect that in the visual language or aesthetic of the film. Um, it, it uh, you know, when I was discussing aspect ratio in general with Ryan, Ryan Jackson Healy, my cinematographer, we wanted this objective reality. We wanted it to feel like you were there. We didn't want to draw attention to ourselves. We kind of had this mantra of let's not get in the way. That you should never feel the director. We don't want the director in the way or the cinematographer in the way. So we knew we had to begin either in 185 or 21, which is what we're in. We just wanted it. We didn't want you to think about it. So a two six seven or two four two three nine, the, the very cinematic aspect ratios to begin the film would call attention to storytelling, I guess. And um, I wanted to find our way there. So so we made this decision to stick with it. It's also the lenses are different. We started with these spherical. Um, what were they? Oh gosh, Kawa vintage lenses. Mm -hmm. So you have this kind of gritty, almost this sort of gritty feel. We're, we're really hoping you just feel like you're witnessing life. You just this, We're just presenting real life to you. Whereas these Cook anamorphic lenses we had had this kind of moody quality. Uh, the last, whatever, I think it's probably 30 minutes of the film that are in the sort of the 267, very, very wide. It's, um, it's a sort of a different, different emotional realm that they've entered, right? And it's things really slow down, even our page count. We, I'm, get, I'm probably getting ahead of myself, but we, we started that conversation doing 10, 12 page days. And as soon as we switched to anamorphic, everything is much heavier and tougher to get through. So we were kind of switched to three, four days, and we had a lot more time for lighting setups. You you really feel Ryan and our gaffer Francis Croon's work, and in the mood of it all. Who were your imp inspirations when you were watching the film? Because um, one of the things that is so powerful about it is the fact that we are claustrophobic. Yeah. Um, and we're like flies on the wall yeah. about what's happening. Yeah. Um, for starters, we talked we talked a lot about my dinner with Andre because mm. we just we just wanted the confidence that this can work. You know, my dinner with Andre is you you know five or six setups. Once they're sitting at the table, if you haven't seen it, you know they just sit there, and it's kind of a couple singles and a two shot. And the, I think the movie's great. <laughs> so, powerful. But, I mean, so uh, we we had that in our back pocket, so to speak. Like, you know, we, we, didn't, we didn't want to reinvent the wheel or try too far and overreach. We just thought, look, we can do this. We have to have faith that this conversation is compelling enough and we have the performances, so let's not overthink it too much. On the other hand, I looked a lot at uh, the, uh, scenes from a marriage, particularly the first episode, which which begins as a documentary. In Bergman, they're, they're filming the couple and they're just being interviewed. And it's sort of a two-shot, occasional singles. 
as the episode goes on, we go to a dinner party with their friends, and before we know it, the dinner party is completely off the rails. Their friends are, are having this bitter, ugly fight right in front of them, and somehow we've gone from this documentary into these strange sort of French overs of these, these dinner party, the couples, and having these internal uncomfortable moments of witnessing their friends falling out, and it, and, and it happens so seamlessly. So that really worked as kind of a roadmap for me about how can we, how can we begin sort of still and static, uh, how can we begin simply and end in a really sort of emotional interior kind of world. Um, and I can talk more about even the beginning before the conversation. Correct. Yeah. Actually, it was my yeah. follow-up question is the fact that structurally, script-wise, you don't start the story with the main characters. You lead us yeah. through the subsidiary uh, characters, yes. you know, supporting <laughs> players. Um, you know, tell us about leading us into the story with that choice. I, uh, yeah, I appreciate that. I, uh, I have trouble conveying this. So hopefully this makes sense. I really believed, you know, when people read the script early on, uh, there was a, there was encouragement to just make it a forehander. You know, why don't why don't you just start with the morning and having the Richard and Linda getting up for you know having their breakfast and going on a drive and and I really believed if it was just these four characters, um, and I I don't mean for this to sound insensitive, it, it would be like it going to the zoo that we get to come into the theater, the safe space, watch these four tragic people and then go home. That, that the, the empathy and the connection that we'd build with them would not be as strong because it would be a story, it'd be a movie. And I thought if we trick you, so to speak, if we sort of lead the audience in through this kind of other direction and slowly ease them into the story with characters that feel more like us in the sense that they haven't experienced this unimaginable tragedy. We've all experienced loss, but most of us haven't experienced anything like what these four parents have. And it, we kind of lead you in and coax you into the story slowly. There's only, you know, very wide shots, static shots, the first close-ups reserved for Martha Plimpton. We like ease into the story. And they're also a little goofy. We laugh at them. You know, there's um, that AA joke at the beginning. Um, it would have would have no business later in the movie. It, you know, it would not, it would, it would have, it would have stuck out in the conversation. So we're trying to tell you you're in a movie and you can relax and have fun and laugh at these people so that you're sort of blindsided by the parents when they arrive. And, and I actually, I think, I hope, that that actually give, makes us feel con more connected to them, that, 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 that they feel a part of our world and not uh, the world of um, some other movie that's just about four sad people. Uh, you know, yeah. Also, structurally, when it comes to the script, you, you create so much tension and suspense about us trying to figure out the dynamics and like who killed who, um, et cetera. And it's not, there's, it, it, eventually it's revealed yeah. and all our suspicions and mechanisms of trying to figure out what's happening is revealed. Yeah. You know, can you tell us about building that suspense? Yeah, yeah. Um, it, I, I, it's certainly welcome that it creates suspense, right? It's sort of, I, I, but truthfully, I, my main sort of focus there was thinking about um, what what would these people truthfully talk about, knowing that they have this information. Um, they they wouldn't need to walk into the room and talk about what happened because the four of them know. If if the specifics of the day ever come out, it most likely would come out of emotion. Um, it would come out in a sort of urgent way, um, as it does eventually. It's almost used as an attack. So, so they have, they're sitting on a lot of information. It's six years later. They're trying to find out new things, or at least they, 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 they have ideas of what they want to get out of this meeting. Um, it all sort of, I think, happens um, in ways that they didn't plan or imagine. But that was that was what I tried to pay attention to. Um, what would be top of mind, I guess? What would be the thing that you would need to say? What, what are you curious about? And it's not necessarily, 
you know, your son killed mine because we know all that. Um, so, so I, I hope that does that kind of make sense. I, you know, oh. it, it's it's great sto as storytelling, I suppose, that we get to lean in and wonder, and it's sort of gripping and suspenseful. But it was also it, the, the most important thing was: is it sort of is it truthful? Does it feel like real life in the sense that this is? They're not withholding information, you know, to to tell a good story. They're withholding information because they would have no reason to talk about it. I guess um, one of the powerful, many powerful aspects of this is the fact that it's real time. Um, you know, this discussion is happening in the ninety minutes that that it takes place. Um, when did that choice come about for for you? Yeah, that was, I mean, I was always, I was always adamant about that, and um, I mean, that was the script, and, you know, people said, even supporters of the idea, you know, encouraged me <laughs> to, to mix it up, um, you know, thought was you need flashbacks, you need, you know, inserts, or, or maybe they can take a break and step outside, and I felt, you know, when I came across these meetings, and we can talk more about where it all came from, um, when I read about these meetings, doing research about these events, I made that connect, this connection to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa, these amnesty hearings that I'd always been so moved by, but sort of scared by, because I didn't think I could do that. I didn't think I could participate in something like restorative justice if I lost someone, that I'd want retribution. Um, and so I was both, I thought what these people did was extraordinary. Um, and I wanted to know how it worked, and so I thought if we comprom under if we if we ha use flashbacks or sort of conveniences of film, I would be undermining the the the, the subject of the movie. You know, I would I would not be telling the story I want to tell if if I if I don't keep us in the room, you know, and I, I don't make us all do the work and, and, and yeah, sort of suffer through it. And it is exhausting. It is challenging. It, it, it should feel that way. Um, you know, it's meant to be tiring <laughs> because there's no other way to do this. You know, this, this would never be easy. And so I, I, that was one of the things that I really held, for, you know, I, I, I really sort of dug in on. Obviously, I do have this image and I do have this cutaway, um, but, but it, was, it, it felt to me we wouldn't be celebrating the sort of strength and courage that it takes to sit across the table from someone you disagree with or feel hate or blame towards if we, if we cut away and, and had, or had music. You know, that was another thing. It's only practical music, you know, the, the piano lesson and the choir. Yeah, yeah diegetic, yeah. yeah. Um, um, speaking of music, the language, I, I, I've seen the film, um, disclosure here, I've seen the film a few times, and I'm blown away by the dialogue. Um, there is syntax issues. Yeah. Um, there's grammatical problems with the way they talk, mm -hmm. but but that's the way you know we talk on an everyday level. You know we 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 use even I coming up with this question. I'm using sick. I'm I'm messing up my syntax. Um, but I've never seen that in a film before where it's so calculated the grammatical errors, yeah. syntax issues. You know, can you talk about yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I hope I don't expose myself just using bad grammar here now. I, um, I, 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 I wanted it to feel like real life, and I believed we contradict ourselves or we are redundant um, or we, there's a, there's a moment early on where, uh, Linda or Richard is asking, are you, are you going to stay? And Jason and I said, you know, well, we have a hotel arranged, but we, we might not. And she says, go back. And he says, want to stay. But they're making the same point, even though, you know, they're essentially, you know, they're, they're essentially on the same page, even though they've, they, they've sort of arrived there differently. So they kind of just shrug it off. And I, I just felt like that's kind of a, a snapshot of how I feel very often real people talk and behave is this sort of shorthand, even with strangers, and the sort of, 
you know, this, this idea that, that, you know, words can kind of only take us so far and that there's feelings are this, there's this undercurrent and this emotional language that, that we all sort of speak and can intuit with one another, which I think is sort of a, a bigger theme in the story and that they search so deeply for understanding and meaning and try to make sense of this thing and ultimately what's sort of the salvation is so much more in just the feeling a connection and not necessarily being able to name it. So I tried really hard to mess it up um, and uh, listen to my actors. I mean, we can get into that, into the rehearsal process and um, you know how the script evolved with them. But it was, it was very much uh, trying to trust that it didn't have to be so neat. And I think a lot of, like I had a lot of inspiration from some uh, off-Broadway, uh, this Annie Baker, playwright Annie Baker, who I felt kind of used language like that. And um, uh, I had just worked with this uh, writer-director Richard Nelson at the Public Theater in New York right before I, I went to make this movie. And, you know, he was he was someone in a rehearsal, early in a rehearsal, he would say, hey, if there's something that's not working for you, tell me and I'll change it. And I, <laughs> I thought as an actor, I thought that's crazy, that it's my job, just give me a minute, let me try and figure this out. I didn't love it at first. I, I, I was a little up, off, put, put off by it, but he, what I realized, it wasn't, he wasn't compromising his story he was finding ways for us to stay in it, you know, stay in the story by sort of speaking more colloquially or 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 just being connected to it in a way that would keep us on the emotional journey we had to go on, I guess. And speaking of journey, it goes through, we go through grief, anger, forgive, forgiveness, acceptance, and connection between the characters is that, it, I'm assuming you plot it that carefully that that journey through all the different emotions. I mean, I I don't I I believe it or not I I not necessarily sort of five stages of grief. I I you know I tried to write as if I had four leads, you know, four protagonists. You know, I didn't try and make um, there wasn't good or bad or protagonists and antagonists, and I I tried to put myself in their shoes. I, in my research, I did not come across, there may be exceptions, but I did not come across parents that were bad people, um, even in some of the most abhorrent situations where people clearly made mistakes or even broke laws, like in the case of Nancy Lanza giving her child guns. Um, you, you, even I, I, as a parent, or, or I think we can relate to this as a person, you just, you make mistakes just by being in love and that unconditional love for a child or family member, inevitably you make mistakes. So I really believed these were good people, sort of tragic, messy, complex human beings. And, and so I wanted to defend them and write them that way. So I guess if anything, as it came together, I would take passes where I would really focus on Richard and you know where what's Richard's journey and what's Jay's journey. Now what's I'm going to read the script and just find Gail's pathway. So I think these things sort of emerged. Maybe there's a reason the five stages of grief are what they are because this, these things sort of they feel true and they they sort of they 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 kind of materialize that way. Um, but uh, I think each character kind of has a conspicuous relationship with these stages, mm -hmm. and we might feel that over the course of the movie, perhaps, maybe, I'm, I'm thinking. But I didn't think of it necessarily as here are, my, here are my stages. I knew, because of these amnesty hearings, I wanted to see if these people would forgive them, right? Um, I, I, I sort of knew that that was it. That's my point A and B. They kind of start, and the, the parents are going to forgive them. But let's see how we get there. And it was clear to me that Jay, you know, would would not participate in that. And not that he didn't feel it or need to. Or I, I think he comes to the realization that he has not processed the grief the way he thought he had. That he mm -hmm. has sort of channeled this and through activism and he with through science, he feels he's sort of mastered what happened and it doesn't affect him. And that being exposed the way he is in the meeting with so much anger, still being so at war with grief. I think I think he's um, distracted by that towards the end of the film. We have been so programmed uh, going to the 
to the movies where you have an antagonist and you have a protagonist, you uh, address, in, in, even when I started watching the film, I was looking for who is the antagonist here yeah. and, and who is the bad person here, and you blurred that line completely. You know, can you tell us about approaching the story? Yeah, I, I wonder, uh, thank you. And I, um, I mean, I love that. I think that's fantastic. <laughs> I, uh, I, I wonder if it's being an actor that, you know, I, if I'm playing a bad guy, I, I don't. That's not how I think about it. You know, I think it's my show, whatever the size of the role <laughs> is. I think, you know, I, I'm sitting here and I'm, I, I know this. I have the story. I, I have these desires and wants, and so you don't really think of yourself as this sort of bad guy. Um, that's how I talked to my actors. You know, I couldn't talk behind the character's back, right? I. I I had to, I sort of fought for them, and I tr tried to sort of, you know, with, with Reed, with Richard, who, who let's, let's just, you know, be honest, would most conspicuously sort of be our, you know, he, he doesn't participate in this meeting like the others. He seems to be in a, some sort of denial, or he wants, to, he, he can't, he can't um, show his emotion like the others. And uh, he's hard. There's a hardness to him. So, to, for lack of a better word, we could sort of call him the villain. I spent all my time with Reed, speaking about what a what a jerk Jason Isaacs is, and what a blowhard this guy is. And look at him get on his soapbox and how this is. He doesn't know what he's talking about. You know, trying to. Um, you know, there's no like I said, speaking behind a character's back. I. I and and just again with the research, I didn't I did not find it to be the case. Um, again, Nancy Lanza, who who c c essentially committed a crime, uh, letting her you know m underage son you, you know own guns and you know saying you know sharing them with her son. Th this is a woman who spent you know a decade of her life going to doctors, writing emails, completely distressing over her son. Um, and then she's killed for it, you know. So, so, so I didn't look at this person as a as a monster. Um, you know, I, I looked at this as just a tragedy. So I tried to uh, I tried to find that in both my uh, both the parents of the of the shooter and Linda and Richard. Mm -hmm. You've you've uh, mentioned about your research a few times, and yep. I actually, you know, would love to hear. At length, no, well, no, no, you know, not for hours, but like <laughs> the, um, the the research that you've done, and you've mentioned South Africa and apartheid. Yeah. Um, you know, can you tell us how the connection between South Africa apartheid and mm. and. Uh, I, th I, I, I learned about that in college, um, and I, I read this book by Desmond Tutu, No Future Without Forgiveness. And, and like I said, I, I was m amazed and moved. It's inspiring, but I, I really didn't, I did not think I could do it. So at the day of the Parkland shooting, I, I was now a parent. I was reacting to it differently. My daughter was about one and a half, and I was overwhelmed listening to these people, uh, these parents that day. And I, that night, was on Amazon ordering books about Columbine. You know, I was 18 when Columbine happened, so this is something, this has been my adult life, this stuff. And um, I, I felt like I need to know what the hell is going on. And so, you know, what about Virginia Tech, Aurora, Sandy Hook, Norway, uh, Parkland, and uh, Columbine, and you know, the list goes on. Um, pouring into this and reading about it. And it was these meetings. It, th these meetings, it, it, it's exactly what I had sort of feared. You know, this idea, could I forgive? Could I um, move forward in an effort just to heal and just to reconcile, not punishment, not retribution? And it felt like that's what these parents were doing, just by the nature that there was no perpetrator and there was no longer a victim. It was just the people left over trying to make sense of it and trying to move forward with their lives. And I wanted to know, uh, I mean, so much of this movie is this sort of personal exploration and just into wondering, could I do this? How, what would I do? Um, and it's the most painful circumstance you could imagine, but I'd like to think that, you know, you, we can, we can, 
see this in a more universal in a more universal sense about just division and just disagreement and you know we live in this divided country and 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 it's vaccines or masks or even with family members and politics and so i i really felt like the nature of what these people doing do is so extraordinary um, that that was so much of the the sort of the motivation behind it, you know, trying to tell a story about people talking and people listening, and and take away everything else, strip away everything else, and see if these people can, you know, find uh, common ground. Yeah, and connection. Connection. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think you know the movie's so there's so much there's obviously this notion of forgiveness, but I think much of for me, and I, I love hearing people's interpretation, and Ann Dowd and I talked a lot about it, but that, you know, when she comes back, the forgiveness doesn't benefit everyone equally, right? Ann and Linda and Richard kind of have to sit there, and it's, I feel like Linda appreciates it, but there's not, there's no, there's no, no salvation for them by the forgiveness. You know, they, they still have to, they live with themselves, they live with their son's actions. Ann is much more on a journey, I think, just to reconcile loving her son despite what her son did because she i think she is a mother needs to be a mother and she can't be a mother if she can't love her son so she's trying to reclaim this I identity and um the forgiveness isn't going to help her with that and i think she comes back to say essentially there, there maybe there's something deeper something greater and it's just that desire to connect with people. You know, I talked to her about the the St. Francis and the leper, this idea that he ab abhors this sort of, this thing that just disgusts him, but he embraces it. And I the, this notion of trying to comprehend the incomprehensible, that it's, that it's, it's, it's forgiveness might not be necessary if we try to make that effort to connect and understand and see the humanity and the people that we, we disagree with. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, what a remarkable cast. Yeah. It's an incredible ensemble. Yeah, um, <laughs> and, um, you know, how did it come about uh, casting? I know that you, you wrote the part of Richard for Reed yeah. Burney. Um, but, you know, tell us about casting them. Yeah, I, um, I knew Reed from just doing theater in New York. We were friends, and so I wrote it for him. I had, you know, I thought no one, no one uh, you know, the movie would be very small. So I'd just try and get favors from New York theater friends. And, um, it, but no one was giving me the time of day. <laughs> and uh, so I wasn't getting any financing. It was trouble hard just getting people to read it. So I, you know, I, I, it all happened very quickly. And I, if there's aspiring filmmakers, independent filmmakers, this, this was it. I mean, in a month, all of a sudden, I had agencies calling me about the movie. And, um, and that's after a year of trying to get just anyone's attention. So I, I opened, you know, I created an LLC online. I put some money in the account. Um, I told people I was partially financed. And I started, uh, I found a location. And I had a date, because in Sun Valley on Thanksgiving, the ski mountain opens and prices would skyrocket. So I said, we're shooting in November before Thanksgiving. And um, all of a sudden, oh, and I had a, ca a casting director. I hired casting directors, so I wasn't cold calling people. So I had a representative, you know, speaking for me. And within a week, I had a list from one agency with Martha Plimpton's name on it. These were people who were available. And then I got another email from my own agency saying, would you be interested in meeting Jason Isaacs? And uh, and I mean, this was my agency didn't give me the time of day for like a year. They were just like, you're an actor. Please don't send us a screenplay, you know? Um, so it was amazing how quickly it happened. And for someone like Jason, my first reaction was, no, he's too, he's too famous. I, you, if he walks in the room, Harry Potter, it's, it's Lucius Malfoy. We can't, that'll break the illusion. But then I, you know, got over myself and... Um, had coffee with him, and he actually scared me because he was he had so many questions. I, I walked away from that meeting thinking, I can't work with him. That's too intense. And then I just thought, you know, that's the, <laughs> that's the whole, that's the job. That's the whole point. And um, he, he continued to ask me questions constantly, even on set. But we, he made it better, you know. You have to, you fight for your material, you defend it, you think through it with someone and new ideas emerge, and um, Anne came on last. I think Linda was the hardest, Linda was the one role I could never see in my head, 
Um, you know, I had other actors in mind, and I couldn't see Linda. And I think in many ways, the location helped the world. You know, that's where she's moved to. And I think the other actors. And then we saw Ann Dowd's name. I had a conversation with her. Um, we had a two and a half day rehearsal in New York before shooting in Idaho for 14 days. And um, the, the two and a half days were essential. And it was, just, it was basically table work. And I, try, I told the actors, like Richard Nelson, I, I said to the actors, whatever doesn't work, tell me. Just tell me where you feel like things are missing and we're gonna figure it out. And so, um, you know, easy examples. There's a scene when Richard and Linda are talking about the day of the shooting from their perspective. It was written as these kind of monologues, these kind of bouncing monologues, and it was kind of slow. And we were doing that scene or reading through it, and Jason Isaacs looked at me and he said, I don't want to listen to this. Why am I listening to this? I don't want to listen. And it was, it was such an honest reaction. We just, I wrote it in, you know, and said, so You see that in the movie. He has that moment of saying, I, I don't want to listen to this, you know, and trying to find those things to sort of keep them locked in. So every little step was there to carry them on their way because ultimately, you know, they're better actors than I am. I knew I had to be out of the room. I didn't want to be. I wanted to leave them alone as much as possible. We try, almost treated it like a uh, like a love scene. You know, it was just the camera boom operator, my first AD. I told him to call action and cut. You know, I really wanted to immerse them in the world. We had 15, 20 minute takes sometimes, so it was important that it, it really felt like theater almost, you know. So tried to create an environment for them to just go. So my, the best thing I could do as a director would be uh, be a writer, you know, to, to, to make sure the words were there. Um, Martha, at the end, and that sort of when she forgives them, it was basically there, but Martha kept coming to me saying, you know, why is this so hard? They've poured their hearts out. I know it's not their fault. You know, why is this, why should it be so hard to forgive? Um, and that, you know, I'd, I'd go home and sit with it, you know, and that sort of, that's where that notion of um, uh, if I forgive you, I'd, I'm afraid I'd lose him. Um, you know, that, that clarifying, I guess, exactly the, the hurdle, the, this thing, this obstacle. It's, it, uh, hating these people is how she keeps her son. You know what I mean? If I let go of that, what happens to that relationship? So, you know, finding those things and trusting actors' instincts to tell me, you know, I mean, good actors have great instincts, and so that's what I needed to know. I needed to know, you know, where, where the, where is, where is everything not crystal clear, so I can make it just a little bit better for you. And then, um, yeah. How much of an asset was it that the majority of the actors you were working with are theater actors, yeah. and in particular, the fact that I cannot imagine the. As, an, as a person mm -hmm. dealing with all that grief and emotion, mm -hmm. it must have been brutal for the actors to be dealing with that. <laughs> I, you know, they, they seem very, ha I, that was, I would go home to my hotel and just freak out thinking, why did I do it this way? You know, with 14 days, the conversation was eight days. So as soon as that door closes, it was eight days you know, five, 10, 12 page days, and then about and three. You, I'm sorry to interrupt, but you, you shut the film chronologically, right? Yeah, well, the conversation. So the first three days were basically the supporting, the opening, and then we had about two or three more days um, with all the, the basement. You know, the, the first thing Ann Dowd shot was that basement. Um, which is a pretty, yeah, which was a kind of a crapshoot, you know, like, I, th I hope we get this right. <laughs> um, she, it, it, that, that, there was nothing we could do about it based on actors' availability, uh, but, but the, that uh, we took about a day to get them seated, you know, and have Kendra, Michelle Carter, leave the room and close the door, and then the conversation was real time. But we had to sort of mix up everything. But, you know, they're, they're pros, and we do this. You rarely have the luxury of doing this on a film, but, you know, shooting chronologically. So to have the conversation that way was a gift, and I, it, it, it was necessary. I, I think no one would have thought to do it otherwise. Um, but, but yeah, they, they, you know, they, look, I think they talk about it now, and I think they're, you know, I think we all look at it, you know, in hindsight, probably, you know, like it was, the movie's doing well, so it's all great. Um, I'm <laughs> sure it was hard to do all that. And I didn't sit, sit around telling them how to be emotional. 
uh, I, you know, I, the words were the words. I tried to sort of sculpt more specific things. I tried to give the actors, leave the actors alone. You know, I, I've never done anything like this. I do know, you know, when you are an emotional scene or an uncomfortable scene, very often you don't want to be bothered. So, you know, hair and makeup, I said no last looks. Uh, wardrobe, don't, I don't care about continuity. If, if it's glaring, we'll all see it on the monitor. The actors will know it. For the most part, we're gonna leave them alone. We're just gonna let these things happen. And if I need to give a note, I'll walk in and do it. But for the most part, we, we, it was like live theater. And one of the reasons the theater element, and they're all stage actors, it's that idea of listening, you know, that, that so much of this movie I thought was going to be the coverage would not be necessarily the person talking, but the person listening and their reactions. And, you know, theater actors have to be engaged. You know, they have to, you know, they have to be present. Um, they're, they're, they're visible, right? So, so making sure that these were actors that you would never worry about them waiting for their line or not being completely present, you know, all, at, all, at all times. You know? um, Tell us about arriving to the title itself, which is yeah. so, you know, up to interpretation. It could be so many different things. Was that the title all from the get-go? I had, I had, you know, I was writing, I, my early titles were kind of children's sort of references to nursery rhymes and children. You know, so much of this was about my own parenting. I'll get emotional talking about it. Um, you know, it, it's also it's also what you read. You know, the things that you have to learn reading about this, and uh, children, students, teachers. So there was this idea of um, how we raise children and and what they are at the very beginning and the sort of sweetness of it. Um, but but it it was they were they were soft and people you know didn't really care for them. <laughs> and I think out of um, defensiveness or, you know, st as a sort of a pushing back or kind of resentful reaction to, they didn't like my nursery rhyme titles, well, how about this title? You know, I want it, and this is really just direct. But I, to me, it's the secular meaning of, you know, the assembling of bodies, people coming together, people gathering together, a crowd of people, you know, a mass. Um, it's, it's not the religious, it's, it's not the, the shooting, that, that to me, I mean, of course it is those things, um, but to me it's that almost scientific sort of the, the, the assembling of things, the, the gathering of a, of, of a mass, which is what these, these people are doing. You know, it's the sort of the action and function of the film, these people coming together to make sense of something. Um, so, you know, th there was a lot of, there was um, pushback about the title. Um, Internally, uh, we thought it would uh, first the religious connotations would put people off. Then it was, you know, if something happened, it might feel exploitative. Um, but uh, you know, I I don't mean to sound self-important. I think it'd be wonderful, you know, if if uh, if this was if if when these things happen and you see this word all the time that you thought more about working and working through it, working through the sort of pain and coming together to figure out a way through all this. And how do we, f how do we fix this? How do we stop this? You know, I'm trying to take something out of or find something antidotal to the sort of the heaviness and darkness of the word. Um, I don't know. So it, it became, it got personal for me and I sort of had, I fought for the title. Um, but uh, yeah, I know it's not for everyone. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, you you starred co-starred in 2012 on Broadway in this remarkable, which I got to see, production of of Death of a Salesman with Sil Philip Seymour Hoffman, Andrew Garfield, yeah. and and it was directed by the great mm. Mike Nichols. And I couldn't help think about Mike Nichols directing. Yeah. Um, when I was watching your film, the simplicity in the choices, and but the steadfast um, lock on great acting and the <laughs> specificity that led to universality, you know, yeah. was, was yeah, working I, on that that it influence. No, I appreciate it. I, um, I look, I can't compare myself to Mike Nichols. I did bring my. Uh, Oh my God, I'm getting emotional. I have my, my folder, my uh, script of Death of a Salesman to Idaho 
with all my little notes, because they're basically just all these one-liners from Mike Nichols, <laughs> and all these like little gems, um, and uh, trying to find ways that I could, you know, um, uh, use his words, you know, but it was also, it just felt like a thing to hold on to as I went through this experience. Um, I thought, so Mike Nichols, Mike, we rehearsed, so Broadway, you get about five weeks, and then you go into tech. Um, we were four weeks in, and he was, he'd never gone on his feet, and he was 80 at the time, but he just sat in a chair. We were rarely on our feet. He never blocked it. And even the veterans, like Bill Camp and, you know, Phil and Linda Emet, people started to kind of whisper, you know, what are we doing? You know, when are we going to block this? And, and then in that final week, he kind of, you know, just sort of put it together very easily. And it sort of, it sort of, it was, it was pretty, um, it wasn't that complicated. You know, once we finally got to it, we thought, okay, well, this is sort of what it is. And we were using the original set design, so we, we didn't have a lot of choices to make. But it occurred to me much later that all he was really doing was just letting us sit with the material, that the most important thing was to sort of bond and become an ensemble. And the play, a Salesman, is, you know, it's it's just about families, and um, or the f family, and we could all relate to it. And I realized, looking back, what was happening was like a family therapy session. It was like a group therapy. Like, he, he led the way by just telling stories. Um, he would direct through storytelling, right? He would something would happen and he would try to explain what he needed by telling a story about his own life or or something that he knew you know that that seemed to be how he operated at, at least that stage in his career and he would tell the most embarrassing stories about himself or the most vulnerable stories or tragic stories um and then hilarious stories and he was such an open book you know, and it kind of slowly allowed everyone to sort of behave that way, that you could kind of say anything in that room and reveal anything about yourself, that it was this very safe place. And I thought, you know, in that brief rehearsal, I thought, that's what I need to do. I need to walk in there and I need to somehow create an environment that we can talk about anything, um, which was is a lot to ask. And I was nervous about doing it and then Anne Dowd, and it's okay to say this because she would tell you this as well, Within just five minutes, she was talking about her son. And uh, so personal, you know, and her struggles with her son. And that, that was it, you know, within, within minutes. This, this environment, this tiny little room in Times Square, it was it. I knew it. I thought, wow, you know. And I think really what it is is that these four actors are pros and they knew what we needed to do. They knew we can't do this if we don't do a crash course in intimacy, <laughs> you know. So, but, but, but thank, thankfully, they led the way because I was most likely too nervous to. I probably would have told some story and just weirded them out, you know. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's a real, you know, nuance and craft and Mike Nichols is the great, great storyteller. So, but but it was on my mind. So I appreciate you br bringing it up as sort of he had this beautiful, subtle way of working that got everyone prepared. You know, even when we weren't actually doing the the, the blocking, the technical stuff was easy. It was an afterthought once you were locked mm -hmm. into the emotional, you know, the emotional connection to the material. Well, when I introduced the the film, I mentioned. I reiterated, this is first time script, first time director. <laughs> you, we watched this and it's like, it, this is remarkable. It, it, did you have any doubts during the process, second guessing yourself? I, I was, I, the time, time, you know, I would go home. The, the actors, they, they barely had, they barely had time to learn their lines. Um, and they have like 12 script, I mean, pages of yeah, script. They, yeah, it was, they had to memorize all of that. I mean, most of them came directly from jobs. Jason Isaacs left that Saturday to shoot in like New Zealand, you know, the, the final day. And so they're busy actors. We did have that rehearsal, but they really just threw themselves into it. And I thought, yeah, you know, you just, you should have had more time. I did have two cameras, but it was Idaho. It was November in Idaho, so it wasn't really daylight till almost 9 a.m., and then at 5 p.m. it was dark. So we didn't even have 12-hour days, you know, so it was developing this camera system was just crucial and kind of going, I think we basically went count clockwise around the room to follow our son and end against the wall. You know, we really, we, nothing could go wrong. So it was stressful, um, but I believed in the, 
the story. I, I really, like I said, celebrating and kind of uplifting or highlighting that he, this, this incredible human behavior of this sort of transcendent thing of forgiveness and, and working through differences with nothing but words and feelings, you know, nothing but sort of the truth. Um, you know, that, that I just thought it was so inspiring and I, I really believe that people will sit through it. Um, but I, I do remember Ryan Jackson Healy, my cinematographer, he came to the, that rehearsal to do a camera test. And, you know, they were sitting at it, it was a table, they were doing table work and that's the movie. So <laughs> we basically could do a real camera test while they rehearsed. And Ryan, you know, sent me a Dropbox link, you know, a week later of the footage and I knew, I just knew like, I. Okay, if we if we can pull this off, if we if we don't, if there's no disasters in Idaho. These four actors are amazing. You know, this is going to be amazing because it was it was emotional just watching the rehearsal. You know, so and then I had a panic attack editing. Uh, <laughs> I didn't I didn't know how to edit. Um, I was as an actor, I I cried at the rap party thinking I'd like climb Mount Everest and I'd done nothing. You know, um, so I. Uh, I, I had to learn as fast as I could alongside my editor, um, and I, I thought I worried I'd never I'm never going to find the movie. There was too much, but it's a process, and it slowly kind of came to be. But it, yeah, I I think I also I also you know I believe it's hopeful. I know I, I read I can't help but read stuff out there, and you know people say it's it's so hard and it's you know. Depressing, and, and and I don't see it that way. I th it's about forgiveness. It's about the human connection, the power of human connection. Seeing someone's share, seeing, feeling our shared humanity through shared suffering, and yeah, it's hard, but it's meaningful and it's positive, and ultimately, it's positive. And so, I I believed I could never have done this if I thought I was just making a, a downer, you know. No, and it it speaks to our time so specifically, yeah, the time yeah, where we need to listen to one another and um, let our divisions put aside and seek commonality. Yeah, yeah, uh, I hope so. Well, thank you so much, Fran, for being here. Remarkable thank you. film, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, thanks, Robert. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.